morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to service where we worship Christ. Isn't it amazing to come together and share Christ with one another? Isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. I like the enthusiasm. That's good. <laughs> it's overflowing. I know it's deep in your heart. So open with me Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to preach a very um, controversial message, but I want to remind you that this, these are not my words. These are the words of Jesus Christ through Paul to us, and so don't shoot the messenger. And you'll see what I mean. In Colossians chapter 3, we'll read these verses 22 to 4, 1, and um, we'll pray and we'll expound and introduce and try to apply it to our lives. If you're with me in Colossians, we are going through the series of how to live out Christ in our lives, how to, how to do that in very practical ways. And f- in the last few um, weeks, we've been going with Tim uh, through these passages, how to live out in our family lives, in our church lives, in marriage life, and, and parenting life. And now we go into this uh, opportunity to how to live out and honor Christ in our workplaces. So Colossians 3 says this, Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external services, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong, which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So at this point, I want to introduce this, uh, this topic, honoring Christ in your workplace. Honoring Christ in the workplace. I, I, I've come across this, this saying, help wanted. There's an advertisement, help wanted. And uh, the description of job is this, is a menial job, no pay except for board and room, no, change, uh, uh, no chance for advancement, no benefits, no days off, no vacation, uncalled 24 hour a day. Once accepted for employment, the management has the legal right to beat or even kill you as it sees, sees fit. Any takers? Some of you would say, well, I'm kind of there right now. I feel like this is a description of my work and my bosses. But this is a description of the slavery in the ancient world. People were going to work in many ways far more different than we are. And Paul, addressing these slaves and masters relationship he's bringing christ to our real life and to their real life paul is explaining the fullness of life in christ in that situation in the situation when you are slave or you are the master and this is the situation when you kind of you can demonstrate christ the changed life in the changed life that you receive from him the salvation that christ brought to us becomes evident by changed life Change life in our families, change life in our marriage, in our parenting, and also in our workplaces. This is what Paul is laboring. He said, I want you to be different and changed and reflect Christ in everywhere you are. Paul so far addresses three main spheres in relationship where he, we demonstrated this new life. He said that this is how we demonstrate and have peace of Christ in the church among us, how we devote to one another. How wife and husband in relationship demonstrate Christ. How parents demonstrate relationship with Christ and demonstrate Christ to their, to their children. And now he addresses our workplace where we live. Many of us live there for most of the hours of the day, right? You go to work and you spend eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hour shift at you among your employers or your coworkers. And Paul is is encouraging us to look at that situation and to learn from Christ how to demonstrate him in the workplace. And my 
proposition to you this morning from these verses would be very simple. Honor Christ in a workplace as your Lord. Honor Christ in your workplace as your Lord. Look, if our Christianity would worth anything, it must transform our lives. It must apply to our lives at work. Our work ethics are changed because of theology, because what we receive in Christ, because of the gospel, we are changed. We're not only changed here on Sunday morning. We're not only changed in our, in our families, but we're changed everywhere. And if we don't change at our workplaces, then Christianity worth nothing. This is where we demonstrate Christ the most. The fullness of Christ, the hope of glory is revealed through us to the unbelieving world. And and biggest place of that is our workplace. I heard a man was asking a worker of the big company, he's, he was asking, how many people are working at your, at your office? And he said, about half of them. <laughs> about half of them. It's, it's how we have the attitude to our work. It's reflect what relationship we have with Christ. Now, I'll bring you just the, a little bit of, of historical context because we just, we just landed on verse 22 when he addresses two relationships between slaves and masters. And you would say, well, we don't have slaves and masters today, but it would help us to realize that we are far more better place than they were at that time, Christians at that time. And it would put us in the perspective if they should act in such a manner towards their job, so of course should we. Now, it's not equal, uh, uh, exactly equivalent, but there's a lot of principles that we could learn. So those slaves, when Paul is writing to them, and notice that Paul writes to wives just one, one little sentence, why be subjected to your husbands, that's it. He, to, he, and then he husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. It's just very, very brief. And then he goes to children and he spends just one verse. And then he goes to fathers, just one verse. And then he spends three, four verses on slaves. <laughs> it's interesting in the context. Now, slavery in ancient Rome, it was, it was just a, a common thing. It's, it's, it was estimated that about half of the population of the Roman Empire was, were slaves. About 60 million people were enslaved. Let's imagine. The early church in Colossae, most of them perhaps were slaves. Do you remember who was the, the pastor or, or who had the church in his house? He was a slave owner, Philemon. And then Paul is sending Onesimus, who came to Rome, a runaway slave, and he sent him back to Colossae to be slave. Now, it's interesting that uh, because of this uh, massive enslaving, uh, practically everything was done by slaves. Every dirty work and every noble work that we call, call today that was done by slaves. For instance, slaves were not only uh, di uh, ditch diggers, but also doctors and lawyers and teachers and even some politicians were slaves. So the, the Romans, uh, the attitude to the work was that it's devoted to slavery. They live with their masters in their household, and they called, many of them, they live in one family, and they called this familia. But even though some slaves had a great relationship with their masters, most of the slaves were not happy. You could imagine, on the mind of the slave was only one thing, how to become free. Now, Aristotle, the most brilliant of Greeks, he, he, said, he wrote this about slavery. He said, slaves could never be friendship with masters. Uh, there could never be a friendship between master and slave. For master and slave has nothing in common. A slave is a living tool, just as a tool is an intimate slave. Later, Roman writer recommend, uh, recommended in buying farms, for instance, to the, to the Roman uh, citizen. He said, toss out the old slaves to die because they were broken tools. Gaius, the Roman, lo Roman lawyer, said, we may not... Uh, uh, we mean, not that it is universally accepted that the master pr uh, possesses the power of life and death and of a slave. 
So the slavery was a common thing in, in, in ancient Rome, and slavery was for uh, all kinds of work, and, and slavery was not uh, a, a good thing and a happy thing. Uh, slavery in Colossae, we know, I already mentioned that we had this. But imagine as Paul is writing to the slaves, he does not call slaves to abolish slavery. He does not do that. It doesn't mean that slavery is good, but Paul just doesn't deal with this issue. And he said, you could demonstrate Christ in the situation that you are in. And let God take care of slavery later in the history. And that's what happens. Now we live in a totally different society. Now if you know, we, we, we're not considering our, ourselves slaves. And Paul, even then, in Colossians 7, tw- uh, Corinthians 7.21, he said, where you call a slave, do not worry about it. But if you're able to become free, rather do that. So Paul is not calling them to be released and abolish the slavery or revolt against slavery. But he said, in the situation, in the horrible situation that you are, you could also demonstrate Christ in your work. Now, for us today, this is just a, a little bit brief uh, uh, context for, uh, for us, and we're far much better place. If you don't like the work, you could just uproot and, and leave. You don't have to serve under a cruel boss. But while you sold yourself for the money, God is expecting you to do it with honor, dignity, be the best worker that you can. Now, what can we learn from these verses and from this slave um, uh, relationship to the masters as for us today? Well, number one, we see that Christ wanted to be honored by humility. By humility. At your workplace, Paul says, Slaves. He calls them by who they are, workers, slaves. He said, in all things, obey. Now, this phrase communicates a huge humility aspect. Because he said, look, you have to obey your masters in everything. It's the same phrase as Paul is saying to the children. Children, obey parents. Incredible. He doesn't say select. He doesn't. He just said, look, you have to trust the Lord and obey masters and everything. Now, it starts, this humility starts that someone stands behind these masters. Someone stands behind these masters. And it's not just the masters that they obey when, when they subject. They obey God himself. Look, five times in this text, and look with me, in verse 22, he says, fearing the Lord. You see that phrase? So when, when a slave hearing this me- message, he is hearing that there's someone commending him to subject to their workplace and to the masters. And that is the Lord. In verse 23, he says, work as for the Lord. Verse 24, reward is from the Lord. Verse 24, again, the Lord Christ whom you serve. And chapter 4, one, master in heaven. So there's a great equalizer and there's a great refreshment for the slave who's hearing these messages that we have actually one who stands above this master, who is watching over. We serve in him, and it's a great equalizer. Masters are the servants of the same master, Jesus Christ. It is the upward relationship with Christ help us to be humble in our relationship horizontally. The way which we treat Christ and we treat him as the Lord, we will follow his commandment no matter how harsh they may seem. Honor Christ as the Lord and you will will have a good start in your workplace. No matter where you are and what your social status, whether you're a manager of a big company or you dig in the ditches, you still have one master and he is the Lord. Whether you're boss in a great company, whether you're worker on the lower scale, we have same Lord. And that is a very encouraging to submit to that God, humility. And Paul says, well, look, when you submit in this humility, you will do the honest service. You will do the honest service. The second thing, the word starts with edge also, humility. The second thing that we could learn here that we... As we submit to our earthly masters here, to our employers, we must do that in sincerity of heart. We must do it from the heart. 
it's not an obligation. Now, remember, he's talking to the slaves who has no choice. You know, you could change the, the churches right now easily. You could have prudence and say, okay, I don't like this church. I'm going to go to that and that church. No problems. But the slave in Colossae, they stuck to the church. They stuck to the master. They stuck to the family. They cannot. And he said, look, and you have to do it not under obligation and the power and the stick, but you have to do it from the sincerity of your heart. Now, how radical that is to hear for the slaves. I mean, I would probably sit in there and say, Paul, can you, can you write something else? Like, can you say, but you, you expecting us to do it joyfully, enthusiastically, sincerely from the heart to our masters, even so some of them are cruel. But that's what he says, obey. Obey, follow, and, and do it from sincerity of heart. And it says literally to the masters in flesh. Masters, those who are actually in flesh and people. And there's a contract to his master in heaven in verse chapter 4, verse 1. So it is this particular boss that you have that you have to submit to him in humility of mind. And whoever he is, you have to do it from the sincerity of our heart. Honor Christ by working in humility. Number one. Number two, honor Christ at your workplace by working from the heart. Paul qualifies the, the obedience here, the obedience that is from the heart. Working from the heart means doing an honest, quality, joyful job. And he compares this here. He said it's not just an, an external service. You with me here? Verse 22, not with an external service as those who merely please men, but with the sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Literally, it says not for the eye service, the superficial service. Paul coined a new word here, external service, eye service. It means that when somebody looking at you, you're doing really, really good. When someone is watching you, you're just performing really well. But if someone take off your, his eyes off of you, and then you just stop doing what you're doing. As soon as the boss leaves, the work stops. You know, the, the 15 minutes break extends to a half an hour break because he's, he's not there. At the gym class, thank you. If you're performing your, your exercise and the, and the trainer is looking at you, you're doing really well. But as soon as he, he looks down, you just, you know, you relax and you do... You do you. The eye service results in a half-done job. A cartoon show the perfectly straight tower of Pisa. And the builder standing in front of it remarks to a friend, I skim a little of the foundation, but no one will ever know it. It's when we are dishonest. When he says that and compares that it's a men-pleasing job, meaning that we are hypocrites. We try to please men while not doing our job really well. So Paul is expecting us to do it from the heart. It means that it's a good quality job. Not a men pleasers, not a hypocrite, but not a double-minded person. His motivation is, is true because he's serving one master. He's serving the Lord, no matter whether this master is watching or not. This master in flesh is a secondary because there's masters in heaven who does looking. You know, it's interesting that many of us, as we're growing up, we are, we're trained by our parents working hard, whether they're home or not. And I remember I was uh, away from my home, and we were living with uh, just a few teenagers, boys, and study in different, different, uh, uh, different city. And, and I remember, like, the, this, this motto was cultivated among us. Like, how can we do uh, so little and, get, and gain so much? How can we appear to look working hard and, and actually gain from that by not working? But that is a hypocrisy for a Christian worker. This is not how we should treat the job, because it is the job that we're doing for the Lord. A few times he reminds us here in verse 24 that it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Whom you serve. You know, I, re I read a, ch a ch 
child's story to my little one. A boy was given an assignment by his grandpa to go and to plant potatoes in the field. And so the boy thought there was uh, a lot of potatoes to plant and just going to take the whole day. So he just got the hole and dumped the whole the potato sack there and just covered it up and went and said, well, I did that. Thank you. So the grandpa was really surprised that he did it really, really quickly, but it didn't pass a month that it was revealed where he dumped all the potatoes because they grew up. So the things that nobody watching, it doesn't mean that you could get away with this. Honoring Christ at work, meaning not to do external show, show for the men pleasing, but for Christ from your heart. Also in verse 23, uh, he said, verse 23, he said that he's, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, so as to the Lord rather than to men. This word heartily expressed enthusiastically, sincerely from the heart. Not to do just sloppy work, but do it from the soul. You know, when you see a singer, and, and he or she sings, and you believe the song because a person sings as she or he believes in it. And you, you're motivated. You are moved. This is the way how we should take the work heartily. We come there no matter what the work is. We do it from our soul, from within. The sincerity meanings in First Corinthians, Chronicles 17.29, David's prayer, he said, since I know... O oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, I, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered all these things. So now, with joy, I have seen your people who are present here make their offering willingly to you. It is the willing, joyful giving yourself to the task. A heart that is motivated by the fear of the Lord is the single-minded heart you serve in one Lord. There's one person to please. If you're working to please Christ, it's guaranteed that you're going to please many other people. This sincerity reveals the true motivation of the soul. Paul doesn't say here, hey, make yourself indispensable so that you will get promoted or so that you, be, uh, you develop a new skill or so that you develop a good Christian character or even so that to maintain a good testimony. He doesn't say this. He just said, look, you just have to work enthusiastically from the heart because you're serving Christ. Nothing could be called and calculated ever inspired the enthusiasm of thousands and thousands of slaves. I mean, he, he couldn't possibly say to the slave, he, you know, you got to work better so that you be promoted. That's not the point of the passage. He said, you just have to work hard, honestly, be the best slave you can be, knowing that Christ is watching it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. He is your boss. This, the fear of the Lord, reveals the true reverence before Christ. Now, how can slave be reverent before the master? Well, it comes from the reverence to Christ. He knows what Christ gave it to him. He knows that he is already freed. Now, if you, if you flip back to chapter 3 in verse 11, we see that, that it is super encouraging for a slave of ancient time to hear these statements. It says, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all in all. What Christ is saying to the slaves, no matter what condition you are in or what social status you are in, you are equal at the foot of the cross. Christ is, is great equalizer for everyone, and you are free in him. This, the fear of the Lord, is the greatest motivation for any good quality work. It was a good, quali good motivation for evangelism and acts when they, in fear of God, evangelized the fear of the Lord is great motivation for sanctification when we are perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's a great motivation to submission to one another in the fear of Christ, meaning that the reverence before Christ 
knowing what he granted us, that he freed us from the sin and death and Satan, and we are free in him, give us a great desire, joyfully serve wherever we are, from the soul, with fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, many of us, we think, oh, this is a noble job to be a pastor, but to be a plumber, you know, this is, we just have to bear with us. No, this is your testimony of Jesus there where you are. This is how you testify that you're truly Christian, that you can bear with unfairness and injustice. And it applies even to our homes, right? How many times, moms, were you thinking after cleaning for 159 times a day, thinking, am I a slave to this house? Am I, am I a slave here? Am I a slave to these children? When it would be over, but you're doing this for the Lord. And you do it from sincerity of heart. You're solely devoted to Christ to do the job because Christ is your master. How many times dads, husbands, you go to work and you bring this check ready spent. You know that this check is already gone. And whether to find a motivation to go on, you say, well, I'm slave to this household. I'm slave to this, to this work. And I, I would never maybe increase in my paycheck. But you are serving the Lord right there on the spot. And it's great motivation that we are walking before the fear of God with the reverence of Christ. And that is motivating us to do the good, honest, quality job. You know, when I sell a car, when I sell a junky car, right, I could envision that Jesus is buying it. Now, that is a great motivation to do a good quality job because I'm serving him. When you sell in your junky car, you know, what do you do? How do you try to, to, to get rid of it? Are you doing it for the Lord? Are you doing it before him? Are you doing it to honor him and to be a great testimony for him? You know, it's interesting that we don't want to call ourselves slaves, but even in Roman Empire, I was talking to Michael, a uh, member of our church, he, he was pointed out that Romans free men who were ruling in Senate and, and, and just be free men, they considered themselves also slaves to the Republic. You know, today, whether you are an employer or the employee, it doesn't matter. We are all slaves to Christ who freed us from the slavery of sin and death. And so we could honor him, honor him. We honor him with humility, number one, and we honor him with from the heart where we are. And number three to the slaves, Paul writes that honor Christ by focusing on heaven. Focusing on heaven. And that's interesting. Uh, again, if you're a slave there, sitting in the pews, and, and Paul would write this to you, the first impression or first thought would come, yeah, easy to say. Easy to say, sky in a pie. Sometimes there was going to be a reward. But Paul is saying, look, Know in verse 24 that from the Lord you will receive the reward. It is there and the heavenly master is watching. There is reward. There's an exciting thing for slave to expect the reward. You know that that time there is no reward for slave. It doesn't matter whether you, if you did a bad job, you're going to be beaten. But if you did a good job, you know, there's no guarantee that you have anything. There was no paycheck, no reward for slave for the service often. But this was unheard of, that being slave, it's not just you be freed, but you're going to grant it, you know what? An inheritance. That's what Paul says here. An inheritance. Who's getting the inheritance usually? Well, usually it's a family members or a child. And Paul is equivalent. So well, although you are in this position as a slave, you are a child of God who has the inheritance of Christ prepared for you. Here's your reward. There's a real status. You are the son and a daughter of living of the most high God. Paul mentioned an inheritance already four times in this uh, in Colossian epistles. Inheritance is not earned. It's just given as a given to the children. There will be a reward for the men who work in the factory just as for the men who went to the mission field. 
There will be a reward for a man who gave his life for science as for the soldier who gave his life on the battlefield. It will be the same reward, reward of inheritance of Christ Jesus that is earned not by you, but by Christ. A diligent and enthusiastic and faithful service which was done for the Lord will be acknowledged and rewarded by Lord himself. Jesus knew the hard work himself. Remember, when Jesus is preparing the reward, he used to work hard here on earth. He spent 30 years doing chairs and windows and, and, and cow yokes and working with stones. He had, he knew the hard work. He definitely knew what was the low paying job also. And yet we read in Philippians that he did it as being God. He became lower than the law worker. He became slave, obedient even to the cross. The ruler of all went down to earn the inheritance for us. What an encouragement. When you go to work next time, you think that you have so good, so good compared to those slaves, but also so good because God pays us so well that when we get to heaven, we would wish that we would serve even better and even more because this is unfair treatment for us. We're getting so good. We don't work as hard as Christ rewarding us. That's the thought that motivates us. But the second thing he says about this reward, that there's going to be a retribution too. Because verse 25, he says, For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that with, without partiality. <laughs> the second encouragement for the slaves is that God will have the retribution. He will punish the evil. And you would say, what kind of encouragement is that? <laughs> what kind of encouragement is that, that, that you would be punished for if you did a bad job? But, but it could go a different way of interpretation that, that the slave would be encouraged to know that, of course, he's going to answer before the bema seat of Christ for everything he has done. But he also listened, and he said, whenever I feel the injustice, unfairness, there is a master who's in heaven who will pay it off. It, it is Jesus who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Don't you go and rebel. Now, if you can be free, do that. But don't rebel. Don't provoke. Don't kill for your slavery, for your freedom. You know, and Christ will do that, it says, without partiality. Without partiality. I like how, in this case, King James Version says, well, and there is no respect for persons. That's what it says. And there's no partiality without partiality. There's no respect for person. When Christ will judge, it doesn't matter who you are here on earth, master or slaves, or how high the status you have. You may be a Caesar of all people, but it doesn't matter for God because he's going to judge justly and fairly. And whatever you did, he will repay. Christians, worker, as an application for us, must be the best worker they could be, knowing that they are working for Jesus. We have to have a good ethics showing and demonstrating Christ in, in these environments where we are, having good attitude, joyful service, knowing that the reward is coming from God himself. Honor Christ as your Lord in a, your workplace. Now, this is for slaves. When Paul is addressing masters, another is uh, amazing thing that, pa that Paul doesn't spend much on masters. He, again, just spends one verse. He gives brief introduction to the slave owners. And as I said, perhaps Colossian church had only a few masters there, and they have a bunch of slaves. And this is what the, the Christianity attracts the Slave first. There's a lot of slaves in the first in the early Christian uh, church. And Paul says, "Well, look, as from the slave that is expected something, it expected something from masters, from the slave owners." 
Now it's dawned on me that when Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon, Paul sent him back to slavery. Imagine that. Now he said to Onesimus, treat him and receive him as a brother, not just as a slave, but yet he was a slave. And he so addresses the master and said, well, look, I understand we're not going to abolish the slavery right now, and God is in the work of doing so, but in this situation, you have to give him a treat, fair treatment. And what he's expecting from the masters and from today's employers, that we could treat workers fairly with respect. He says, masters, give unto your servant that which is equal, just and equal. Give it to them. You own it to them. They do work and you own it to them. You must respect them for what they, what they are. Paul implies that labor is worthy of his hire in Luke's chapter. Uh, uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. The Bible warns us about the mistreatment of workers. And that would happen in James chapter 5, verse 4. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mow your field and which has been withered by you cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord's above. There is much mistreatment in a society, but as a Christian employers, as, as people who hire people, and you might not have a business, but you could hire people to change your windows, whatever you do. You bring the subcontractor. How do you treat people? Do you treat them with low or with respect? And Paul warns masters, and employers of this day to respect workers and give them according to what they earn. How do we treat them with fairness? How Paul wants to, uh, for the earthly masters, treat slaves with, with fairness. To give them no partiality in equality. It doesn't matter who it is uh, that you employ. Him. It is your son. You pay him more. You na- your neighbor, you pay him less. No, there's an equality for every one. I like how in Ephesians 6, chapter 9, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 9, it's, it's the parallel passage. It says, and masters do the same thing to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their masters and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. In a sense, every a worker is worthy to be paid because he's working. Masters, know that you also have to treat them with justice. You cannot just impose on them what is not right. You cannot ask them to do something that is unrighteousness. And it's a good question for, for us. What kind of employer would Jesus be if he would hire you to do the job? How would he treat you? Would he treat fairly? Would he pay well? Would he try to skim you off of your job, of your pay? And the motivation for the masters is exactly the same motivation as for the slave. Notice that. Why should they do that? Well, because it says, knowing, verse 1, that you too have a master in heaven. It's exactly the same thing. There's no different motivation. Masters and slaves are equal in Christ. How? they all been saved by the same Jesus Christ. The motivation to obedience is basically the same for everyone. we all alike before Christ. And we're all slaves to Christ. Paul himself call, often called himself a bond servant of Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus became a slave to God. And he saved us from slavery to sin. Brothers and sisters, we are all workers and employers of the most high God. Honor Christ in a workplace as your Lord. But the biggest reason it's been written all before this passage why should we honor Christ at our workplace? 
Why should we demonstrate Christ where we are? Well, because you've been freed. If you go back and read with me this passage in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, you'll see what I mean. The biggest reason why we must honor Christ in anywhere, in our marriage, in our parenting, in our church, in our workplace, it is because when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. You were slave to death. Now he gave you life. Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt considering the decrease against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out to the, of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We were slaves to the law, and we would not be able to free ourselves. And he removed every bit of accusation, and he made us free when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He freed us from the devil and the, and the power of Satan. You are free. And if you experience such freedom today, the attitude at work should reflect that. The gospel changes the perspective. Gospel changes how we approach any work, is that a testimony of your faith or not? As we go, who do we work for? Who is our real boss? Is it Lord Jesus Christ? Are we walking before him honestly knowing that when no one is watching, he is? When we perform our job, are we trying to scheme or do an honest quality job are we doing it from sincerity of heart or just because we have to earn our paycheck? Are we doing for Christ and the reward that is coming or for just the earthly things? Sometimes we could trade the earthly inheritance, earthly paycheck for the heavenly reward. But if you have not experienced such freedom, if you still think that you're a slave, you didn't really get the gospel because you're not. You're slave to God. No matter what the situation trying to enslave you, even slaves in, all, in, in, in ancient time, they could feel freedom because Christ is freed us to be slaves of righteousness. And if you have not experienced such freedom, come to him today. If you're still feeling like you're enslaved and you're trapped and you don't know where to go, go to him who gives you freedom. And that freedom is the most precious thing that gospel brings. And that applies to any social status of any people. He will take away the burden of your guilt of your failures, of your sins, and he will remove them forever, far, far away, and make you free in Christ. Honor Christ Jesus as Lord at your workplace. Father, we thank you for these verses. We feel like they're almost not like for us it's because we, we have not experienced, many of us, this slavery as Paul is writing. And sometimes we're amazed, like, uh, why didn't you liberate them in one set, in one word, and they would be free. But you encourage them to stay where they are and to manifest Christ in those circumstances. And what a, what a lesson for us. We are here far more free than, than uh, they were. And it applies to us that we must demonstrate Christ, a new life, a changed life, a Christ-like life to the people around us, to the place where you put us in our workplace. 
and to demonstrate them that you are the one who gives us freedom. You are the one who gives us reward, and you are our joy, and you are our glory. We praise you for that. May you help us. May you help us to do honest job wherever we are, quality job, sincerely for you, without grumbling, expecting a reward from Christ, knowing that he's fair and he's just and he's kind. He's the best employer ever. Praise you in Christ's name. Amen.